feeling in between the here and Welcome everybody, glad you're watching this uh, takeaway video from uh, Snowflake 2011. I'm here with a, a bald brother, a couple of cool guys, uh, well, at least one of them. I'll let you decide who's cool. Don't be so hard on yourself. We, uh, we really think it's important to uh, just uh, allow you guys to take some things away over the next couple weeks, or at least this coming week. And so I've got a number of questions uh, for Bill, and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll find this beneficial. So first question for you, Bill. What would you say to the student who felt God so near and real this weekend at Snowflake, but now find themselves at home and just aren't feeling God anymore? Okay, well, you know, one of the things that does concern me sometimes on things like this, that when you're in a community and everybody's thinking along the same line and we're all praising the Lord and singing the same songs and hearing the same message, we're all like together. And then we go home and then we don't do what it takes to maintain that. So we leave a place like this with a tremendous high and then slowly and gradually we begin to digress because we don't continually sustain ourselves either through the Word of God or through prayer or through fellowship with other believers and we find ourselves just kind of slipping away. And so I find that's one of the, the big issues that I see happens to a lot of people, not only with kids, but adults as well. Yeah. How, what role do you think feelings play in the whole uh, walk with God? Because sometimes we feel like we're on a mountaintop, we just want to camp out there. And then other times you question, like, God, what did I do wrong? Why don't I feel you anymore? What, what do you say about that? I, I think sometimes feelings can trick us because feelings are neither right nor wrong. It's what you do with your feelings. But you can feel you're a certain place and not be that place and then feel you're distant from God and maybe sometimes not you couldn't be any closer to God because God is always there so it's not about a feeling it's about the truth of God's word when he says I am never going to leave you I'm never going to forsake you I'm going to be with you always even until the end of the world so he doesn't say you're always going to feel me because then if you live by your feelings which can fool you you're not really living by faith and God has called us to live a life of faith of trusting in him and what he said in his word for sure well some students would say like in their early years they felt God like all the time like, you know, junior high, ninth grade, God was everywhere. And then some students might be watching this and be like, man, I, I haven't felt God in like a year or two years. And, and maybe they're starting to have doubts about should I stay a Christian or not. It just doesn't feel real anymore. What would you say to someone that's maybe been in a prolonged desert experience? Well, you know, desert experiences are part of, uh, are part of life. And uh, sometimes they go for a long time. But it, it doesn't mean that God isn't there. I think... Uh, when I first gave my life to the Lord, even though I was an adult when I did it, it seemingly, I thought I felt God all the time. And then all of a sudden, that feeling wasn't there. And then I thought God had abandoned me and things of that nature. But I continued in the Word. I continued in prayer, talking to brothers and sisters. And then all of a sudden, something just came alive to me and that said, whether I feel Him or not, I know He's there because He's promised that He's never going to leave me. So uh, another question for Bill here. Uh, what, what are some things students can do to uh, gain momentum in their walk with God? Okay. One of the things that I've seen with, with kids everywhere that I speak, they, they really do want to live for the Lord. And, and so they'll, they'll be in a situation like this at a camp experience, a church, and uh, God's Spirit will prompt them to come forward or to make a commitment to Him. And then they don't do what it takes to sustain that commitment in, in respect of vibrance where... Okay, I'm excited about the Lord. I've given my life to Jesus. And you go home and you're all fired up. But then you don't eat. You don't spend time in the presence of the Lord. You don't let the Word of God. You don't go into situations where there's a worship setting. It doesn't necessarily have to even be church or youth group. But even at home or listening to Christian music. Uh, as I look at this stomach that sits around here, I don't miss many meals. But if you begin to miss meals in the Spirit, all of a sudden... Uh, the fire begins to kind of like go down a little bit. It never goes out because I don't think God does that. But a lot of times kids don't do what it takes to keep that fire going by reading the Word of God, by being in fellowship, by being in prayer, spending time with God, and, and being careful about how they're living their lives. For sure. We're both baseball guys, so I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Huh? Nice little uh, analogy there. Curveball. Yeah. Um, some, some, would, uh, some denominations, at least uh, in my background, I was in some denominations where they're so focused on the event and having that mountaintop with God, go to an event, go to lots of events, go to lots of concerts, all that stuff, and, and you go forward for an altar call, and you have this event moment, this moment in time where you made a decision, you're going to never struggle with this again, you're going to like do it. Uh, and then I've been a part of other denominations and other backgrounds where they almost don't want to engage the event because they think that that's uh, you know, all hype and stuff. And they focus entirely on process. And it's only about the process stuff or whatever. What do you think the relationship is for teenagers, the, the balance between event and process, and uh, what are some pitfalls of focusing in on either one at the expense of the other? 
Okay, well, I, I think events are good because sometimes they're a starting point. Maybe you've been in that desert place for a long time, maybe because of your own disobedience and not following God, not doing the things to sustain and, and, and that feed into your relationship with the Lord. And so you go there and now here you are around a lot of brothers and sisters and the Spirit of God is moving in the midst of praise and worship and, you know, whoever the speaker is, they're speaking into your life and it's really resonating with you. And then we leave that and we drop that. And then all of a sudden there are forces that are outside of the event that try to wear you down and pull you away from God. To know that there is, just like Peter, when the adversary wanted to take him out to get his focus off of the Lord, you know, this incredible event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, coming back looking for his kids and how great that was. But then all of a sudden, that event began to wear away and then Peter began to look at himself. The next thing you know, he starts going back to doing what he used to do. And that's where we have to be careful. Events will not sustain us, but they can get us going. But it's it's the focus that takes place after the event, the, the working on your relationship. You know, the Bible says to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It didn't say work for it, of course, but you work it out. And working it out is being honest, having accountability, getting into the Word, praying, confession, all of those things that, that help us keep a continual maintenance going. Sure. What would you say to students that would just submit? they say, well, I, Bill, I, I want to do that, but I confess I'm lazy. I'm lazy. I, I know that I am, and I don't want to be lazy. But I'm lazy, and they, they want to do what you're saying, but uh, there are other sides saying, no, man, you're so lazy, there's no way you're going to do that. What would you say to someone that's kind of stuck there? It's going to be a problem. Sooner or later, I mean, somewhere along, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead. And a lot of times it's so much easier just to lay in bed and take a nap, but somewhere along the line, you've got to get up, you've got to ask God's help. I, I, I think we make up our mind, i got to pull up my own bootstraps and we leave Jesus out of the picture. And so being honest with Jesus, Lord, you know what? You know I'm lazy. You know I don't want to do this, but I'm, I, I, I'm willing to do it. Will you give me some help? And I think inviting Jesus into the process, uh, when he says in John 15 to 5, you can't do anything without me, uh, to really take God at his word. Okay, Lord, I need your help. Help me with my laziness. And I think he's more than willing to do that.